Please welcome Valerie Young, open source powerhouse, a person who needs no introduction. <laughs> uh, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to the talk inside Agalia, scaling a co-op beyond uh, 100 members, a working title for which was More Foss, Less Boss. <laughs> So who am I? I'm a programmer on the web platform team at Agalia. Uh, the web platform team works on web browser specifications and uh, implementation of those specifications, and I specialize in accessibility. Uh, I've worked at Agalia for two years. I'm a pre-partner. I'm in the pre-partner stage, which you'll hear what that means later um, at Agalia. And also, I'm a cooperative enthusiast. I have worked in lots of kinds of volunteer cooperative organizations over the course of my life. I've lived in co-ops, helped run cooperative book fairs or farms. Um, so I've seen a lot of successes and a lot of failures, and I've really enjoyed working at Agalia. So what is Agalia from the outside? This is what most people know about Agalia, our clients, our prospective clients, people who apply to us. They know we're an open source software consulting company that we've been around for a while, since 2001. We have 140 people in 25 countries, so we're quite big and quite international. And you can hire us to do a lot of things, like writing and implementing web standards, like I mentioned, um, but also we work on language specifications and compilers, like JavaScript. We also help embed things specifically browsers, but also other things. Um, and we work on the Linux multimedia and graphics stacks. So what is Agalia from the inside? This is the thing that less people know about, not intentionally, just sort of by chance. Um, we are completely flat and cooperatively owned and cooperatively managed. That means we have no bosses, no managers, no CEO. We all make the same amount of money, and we all have equal decision-making power. And it works. It works really well, uh, not only in terms of us being a company that's been around for 22 years, but it also really works for the employees that work there. Here are some success metrics related to that. Uh, the employee turnover rate, that's the average number of people who leave over the average employees of that year, is around 5%, um, maybe a little less, at Agalia. And the industry average across tech global globally is 13%, which is you know, over twice as much. Um, and so how long do people stay at Agalia? It's hard to say, because 140 of us haven't left yet. So, and we've been around <laughs> 22 years, so there are plenty of people who have been here more than 10 years, more than 15. Um, although we are kind of growing more every year as we get larger. Uh, so the average is about seven years. And I've only been there two years, you might have noticed. Uh, so I'm kind of a baby Agalian in a way. Uh, so why do people not leave? I believe, and also many Agalians believe, it's because we're cooperatively managed. That means that Agalia remains in the intersection of all of the employees' values, interests, and needs. So the company, the work that we do is the same as what we value across the whole company. The, as a, uh, an employee's interest even changes over time, the work remains in that interest, and as your life changes over time, the company continues to meet your needs in terms of your working conditions. So again, it's, uh, it's great. Um, well, there we are, uh, a few minutes into my talk, and uh, how to scale a co-op beyond 100 members, be a co-op, right? OK. Well, obviously, it's more complicated than that. Um, and the goal of the rest of this talk is to demystify some of that complexity. Um, the goal here is not to just tell you how cool Agalia is for a whole hour, although I do think Agalia is very, very cool. The goal here is to inspire you and to make more real to you the possibility of cooperative management by describing a successful cooperatively managed company. I'm also hoping to give you a bit of an intuition for what is necessary for a co-op to succeed so that you can recognize when it is being successful, and you can also recognize when it's starting to fail, or and things need to be adjusted, or potentially just disbanded. You know, sometimes it just doesn't work out. Uh, and to, to continue, um, we're going to start with the abstract, 
we will get into the specifics. Um, but uh, over the course of my career in cooperatives, I can say that I believe these are the essential ingredients to a successful co-op. Um, and they're things that you'll see uh, in Agalia soon. Um, but in the abstract, uh, number one is equality. The more equality, the better. It's difficult to be, to have a group of people feel like equals in this unequal world. So it's something you have to put a lot of effort into, but again, I think it reaps a lot of benefits. Two is shared values and goals. I think this is obvious to anyone who's ever worked on a volunteer project, of course. You have to have shared values and goals. The goals of the project have to be shared by all the members. Um, so the same in a cooperative enterprise. Three is trust, also very obvious. It's hard to make a decision with a group of people and you don't trust each other when you're suspicious or assuming the worst. Um, and it's notable that the previous two ingredients really help this third very essential ingredient. It's easier to trust your fellow project people when they equally share in the success and the failures of the project. And it's much easier to trust, obviously, when you know that you're all working uh, towards the same shared goal and that you all explicitly have the same values. Uh, and finally, respect and appreciation. Um, again, perhaps this goes without saying, but for someone to participate equally or happily, they have to be respected and appreciated. And even to respect and appreciate your peers, you have to be respected and appreciated. Um, I want to point out uh, that these four essential ingredients for a cooperative are not actually really necessary for the traditional hierarchical firm. And I think hierarchical firms are created to continue to exist, specifically to continue to make profit, without these four essential ingredients. That's not to say that they're built to not have them explicitly, it's just that they don't need them, and they could compromise them for other goals of the company, specifically usually profit. Um, and the organizational structure made to handle uh, the lack of these is, is pretty obvious. There's a ton of management, um, and perhaps micromanagement to handle the lack of trust of employees. Um, also, there's a lot of lack of transparency to handle the fact that the company sometimes makes decisions that are against the values of the employees. Um, also, I think I had a third example. Oh yeah, of course, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of carrots on the stick at a company uh, to keep people there despite the lack of respect and appreciation. This feeling that if you work harder, you'll get a promotion and then you'll be respected and appreciated. Or if you work harder, you'll get a promotion and at least you'll get more money. So let's talk about uh, Agalia. Oh wait, actually, you know, just I just want to, there's another point of emphasis here, which is just that, you know, imagine instead of being at a company where it's not necessary to meet these needs, even if they're saying they're trying to, but it, working at a company that won't work if these needs are met. So that's, the, uh, there's a lot of like kind of, you know, built-in greatness to a co-op when it's working. So the organizational structure of Agalia, historical, I'm not actually going to talk a lot about the history of Agalia because it's changed a lot in 22 years. So it's a lot more than you could ever cover in a talk. But, um, you know, that's part, in part by the design. The organizational structure you need for 10 people is different than for 140 people. I can tell you that it has maintained the goal to be as flat as possible the whole time. Um, equality and as much equality as possible has been an explicit goal of Agalia. And also we never took an outside investment, um, which again helps the workers actually maintain control over the company. And there was a talk earlier this week about creating a profitable open source company without venture capital. Uh, so you can look that up by Ann Schlemmer if you are interested in starting a co-op and you, you know, are just too exposed to the funding model of um, investor funding. So, the rest of this talk will be about the organizational structure of Agalia today. There are four parts that I'll go over. The first one is the stages of Agalia, and that's how you advanced in the organization. I mentioned I'm in the pre-partner stage. Uh, then I'll talk about the assembly, which is our decision-making body. Sometimes people at Agalia say the assembly is the boss, which is not really accurate, but we say that sometimes. Uh, three, we'll talk about the agreements, which is uh, how the company operates, the organizational structure as it's written down. And four, teams and commissions, who does what work.
So first, the stages. Uh, there are three stages. The first year, you're in the staff phase. That's kind of like an onboarding year, a whole year of onboarding. Uh, the second two years is the pre-partner phase. And at that point, when you become a pre-partner, you are a full decision maker at the organization. And in the third year, approximately, you enter the final form of an egalian, which is a partner or the legal co-owner. And the goal is for everyone to become a partner. So everyone, the goal is for everyone to move up in the organization and over the course of approximately three years. So that means since you're only staff for the first year and you're only a pre-partner for the next two years, most people at Egalia are partners. And of course, you might be familiar with an inverted version of this triangle, the hierarchical firm, which I'm not gonna make a lot of comparisons to. But I have to say that at Egalia, again, it's an explicit feeling and an explicit appreciation that we're not in competition, in self-interested competition, to move up a triangle for fewer and fewer seats. It's an amazing feeling to just be working with a bunch of people that, again, you're not in competition to, which, which starts the basis for distrust. So who makes decisions uh, at Egalia? I mentioned before, it's these top two stages, the pre-partner and the partner phase. This uh, group of Egalians is called the Assembly of Egalia. So back to our homework, we're gonna be doing this the whole talk. Uh, how do the stages provide essential ingredients to a successful co-op? One, they build trust. Um, the trust building is a two-way street. Before we want a new Egalian to be joining the assembly, we want the assembly to trust the new Egalian, and we also want the new Egalian to trust the assembly and trust that the, the company is already operating in their interest. Um, also, uh, the stages act really as a way to onboard new Egalians to the concept of equal equality. You can't just be told you're an equal. You have to experience it, and you have to really feel like you deserve it too, I think. Uh, and we're not used to that feeling. In no other, almost, unless it's explicitly cooperative, there's no other organization in our life where we're an equal among all of our peers. Maybe in free software? I don't know, maybe. <laughs> um, anyway, so uh, not always in free software, as we know. Anyway, so that by the time that a, a Galleon becomes a partner, they already have a deep feeling of shared ownership. And these steps between the stages are almost ritualistic affirmations of that fact. Okay, on to the next uh, structure of a Gallia, the assembly, our decision-making body. The assembly is all of the pre-partner and partner Galleons, as I've mentioned. It's also two half-day meetings every two months, and an email list. I know what you're thinking. You gotta be kidding. A whole company runs on two half-day meetings and an email list? Is this crazy? How many? <laughs> uh, anyway, well, um, I guess that, I mean, generally that is the assembly, but maybe to help you understand a little bit better, um, these are the major uses of the assembly as I see them personally. Um, one uh, is to keep Egalians informed about the status of the company. Uh, two is to start problem solving discussions for yet unsolved problems. Um, and three, to get feedback on concrete proposals that affect the whole company. And four is final approval, approval or notice before something goes into effect. That like final check before it's, you know, something that Egalia now does. So some concrete examples of assembly material include things like new clients and new contracts. Um, we, this I guess would fall under, it's kind of like a mix between keeping in galleons informed and final approval um, because these clients and contracts are usually a long time in the works with smaller groups of galleons who know that that contract is gonna be reviewed by all of Egalia, so. No one's gonna sneak something in there that the rest of Egalia doesn't believe we should be working on. Uh, new investments are similar. New investments are things that we decide to put work into learning ourselves, potentially new areas of work. Um, that usually starts in a smaller subset and then is, is 
um, offered to all of Agalia to discuss. That's often more of a uh, often can be more of a discussion. Uh, new Agalians, new hires are approved by the assembly. Anything related to money, like salary, donations, and savings, is also discussed and approved by the assembly. And also changes to our working conditions, the agreements, which we're going to talk about later. Um, those things are discussed by the assembly. And often changes to our working agreements really go through this process, ignoring the first step, keeping people informed. The changes to the agreements usually come out of perhaps a problem-solving discussion because there's some, something that's not quite working out or something that needs to change about the structure of Egalia. And then some smaller group makes a proposal about that change and then that proposal of that change after feedback is worked into actual language to put into our agreements and then the final approval before, it's, before it lands. Which, if you're familiar with cooperatives, is really a consensus building model. And very rarely do we feel like we're voting at Egalia. We often just call everything a poll. Or it's the poll, the point of the poll is not only to get a bit of an up down signal, but also to get lots of feedback. So, how does the assembly provide essential ingredients to a successful co op? All assembly decisions and reasoning of all assembly decisions are available to every assembly member, and that builds trust. The company is completely transparent. We can see where those assembly decisions came from, and we can even see evidence of them having been contested and evolved. And also, the assembly acts as an oversight body, keeping the company aligned with our shared values and working towards our shared goals. So, on to the next. Uh, structural element, the agreements. These are a combined values, bylaws, terms of employment, benefits, document. Uh, it's written down and version controlled. PR is welcome, although substantial PRs will have to be approved by the assembly. And the agreements contain our working conditions, which I think includes our values because we only work on uh, contracts that are within our values. It also includes how much we pay ourselves, which, by the way, every year at Egalia that I've been there, we vote to increase that number, and how many vacation days and other benefits. It also contains a lot of process information, like how to progress through the stages of Egalia, how to handle difficult financial times, how to amend the agreements, which company decisions need consensus from the assembly, and which things just need majority vote. And a FOSS interlude, um, so we are a, f a free and open source software consulting company, which is perhaps why it's relevant to be talking about this at a Gallia, uh, at FOSSI, where we are. Uh, and uh, free software is talked about twice in our agreements. And so this is one of the sections on free software in our agreements, and I'm just going to read the bolded parts. Uh, it says, Egalia will give higher priority to projects both internal and external where the outcome of our work is licensed and published in a free and open way. Uh, so this has been a, a motivation of Egalia from the very beginning. Not only did the group of people who started Egalia in Galicia, Spain, want to start a company where they felt like they were equals for their peers, they wanted to start a company where they didn't have to move out of Galicia, their hometown, for a job, and they also wanted to start a company where they only worked on free software. Um, and that's still, you know, we only, we hire people within that value, so we maintain that work. And then the second bolded part says, however, each Egalian can ultimately use the software of their choice and that better fits their needs. And this is also, I think, an important uh, point to point out or to emphasize a cultural norm at Egalia which is to be flexible and to adopt the needs of new members and to treat them as equals when we're discussing uh, their needs or the company needs. In general, we do only work on free and open source software, but some people do run non-free software on their personal laptops, and that's okay. It increases the diversity of the company from our perspective. So how do the agreements provide essential ingredients to a successful co-op? The, for one, I mean, it's the agreements enshrine our shared values and goals. It's written down. Um, you know what they are, and uh, we know we all agree with them. We know it's all laid out. And it also provides a scaffolding for equality between Egalians. And I just, again, trying to 
keep a group of people equal is a real big effort, um, but the scaffolding is in our, our agreements. The fact that we all have equal pay is part of the agreements that requires consensus to change. So imagine 140 people agreeing that some people should be paid more and some people should be made, paid less. Um, this, is, this is part of um, a gallia that's built in. Also, the, back to this point um, about this cultural element of a gallia, this isn't written down, but the agreements are flexible and changeable. There's a culture that they are okay to change. This provides the basis for respect and appreciation and equality between older Agallians and newer Agallians. Because if the whole company was structured only based on what those first 10 people thought, then the company is written in a way that benefits those 10 people and perhaps less the people who later on uh, join the company. And when I mean equality, I really mean equality across every Agallian. Uh, right. So the last section. Um, we're moving on just fine. Uh, the structure, the last thing that I wanted to talk about were uh, the teams and commissions of Agalia, which answers the question of who does what work. So this is a little funny Venn, Venn diagram of the teams of Agalia. The, these little circles represent groups of people. There are technology teams on the outside, the darker orange. Um, and the technology teams are groups of people that work specifically under a specific, we're consultants for a specific kind of technology. Like I'm on the web platform team and we work on web standards. Uh, and then in the center, there's the support team. And the support team, we'll talk about in a bit, but it does a lot of the company-wide work. And there's overlap here because there are some support people who are also on the technology teams. So now we'll go into the details. So these are the technology teams that we have at Agalia. There's eight of them. Uh, in the technology teams, there's kind of two kinds of people, the consultants, which are on the outside of the bubble. Um, these are the programmers who work on internal and external projects. And then there's the support people who are in the overlap, and they work on things like sales, contract negotiations, project management, running team meetings, stuff like that. Um, and just to further explain the complexity here, some people are half support and half consultants. So the work is divvied up in a quite uh, flexible and unique way. And then there's the support team, which is a very, very important team at Agalia. Um, these are the people who work on things like finances and payroll, system administration and internal tools, running company meetings and polls, communications and marketing, and general be generally being very helpful and wise. It has a lot of Agalians that have been there for an extremely long time and have an intuition for cat herding and uh, have seen Agalia evolve the whole time and kind of are there to help shepherd any evolution that needs to help to continue into the fu future. Also, as much as we have an HR department, it's just people in the support team. There are people who have more people-like roles. So if you wanted to talk about changes in your health condition and uh, just needed to like go over that with someone and figure out a new schedule that works for you better, someone in the support team can like work with you on that. Um, yeah, so that's the support team. So besides being on a team, Agalians also have these other two things, which I'll go over briefly. We have roles, and we're also assigned to commissions. So roles are something that are within a specific team. So that's why you see these dots on a leaf of the flower. Um, this is work that both the consultants in the team and the support team share. It's work that you know only takes up a couple of hours a week or a couple of days a month. It's work on sales, work on strategy, work on recruiting and interviewing, communications, internal training, external de demos. Um, so I'm on the, the recruiting and interviewing team, which means that I review all of the applications that come in and set up interviews and do interviews and then talk to the rest of the people about, on my team about whether or not we should want to hire this person or can hire this person right now. Um, and then uh, the other thing is commissions, which are also commissions of the assembly. So these are assembly members who belong to any team and the 
including technology teams or the support team. And they work on company-wide coordination tasks that you know, should include people across every team instead of just people in one team or just people on the support team. So there is an assembly commission uh, that is in charge of putting together the assembly agenda. There's the agreements commission, which is in charge of uh, making sure that the agreements are up to date and wordsmithing if we need to add something new to the agreements. There's the D diversity, equity, inclusion commission, the strategy commissions, there's usually more than one. There, that has to do with any particular new technology we're working on or product that we need to coordinate across multiple teams. Uh, and then there's the Corporate Social Responsibility Commission, which is the all fun commission, so I'm gonna give it its own slide. Um, we're here today because of the Corporate Social Responsibility Commission. We had a discussion a year ago where we thought, well, maybe part of our corporate responsibility or responsibilities to the world is talking more about the success of our internal model um, but other fun things that they're in charge of is donating 0.7% of our income. Um, that's to NGOs and nonprofits decided on by Egalians, and every year we decide how to divvy up that 0.7%. And one of those things is a reforest, natural native uh, reforestation effort in Spain, the Egalia Forest, as we call it sometimes. Uh, and the, yeah, like I said, the CR, CSR Commission is responsible for this one-day track at FOSSI. <laughs> yeah. So the roles, commissions, and teams are voluntary and dynamic. It changes based on interest, need, and encouragement. Um, and sometimes uh, it's uh, by mandate. For example, the uh, assembly commission has to have rotating members. Um, so anything important we want to, and the same with the strategy commission. That, there are things that we want to make sure we're rotating through the members of Egalia. And what does this do? Uh, this is a very important point. I think that the dynamicness of our roles uh, leads to respect and appreciation between the members of Egalians. This is a company where we collaboratively all share the work and decide what, who does what work. This isn't a you're at a Galia, you're not hired to a specific job description to fit like a gear into a machine, whether or not you like the parts of it or you're even good at the parts of it that are listed in that job description. You don't have a boss that's micromanaging you or interested in offloading specific kinds of work to you. So um, that means that over the course of your years at a Galia, you really get to find the ways that you contribute best uh, and that, of course, leads, leads to a lot of respect and appreciation from your peers. Um, and also, because it's all negotiated, every contribution, in a way, feels like a gift, a lot like in free software. Actually, there's uh, several things at Egalia that I think are very similar to free software. One is this, this feeling of, or I would say a lot at cooperatives in general that feel similar to the organizational structure. Uh, that you see in free software, the feeling of being in a free software project. For example, every contribution to the company or the project feels like a gift. I'm sure you're all familiar with the warm, fuzzy feeling of getting literally any kind of good contribution to your project. Well, I feel that way anytime anyone does anything good for a Galia or makes my job a little bit easier. Um, also, you can really see and appreciate the work that other people bring in free software projects. Not all the kinds of works are transparent, but a lot of the work is transparent, and I think there's a recognition that we should make the work as transparent as possible so that we can respect and appreciate it. Uh, and also, in a weird way, we can avoid the kind of work that we hate and are bad at and will make other people resent us. So I, it's like a minor point, but I, I think it, it's an important one in a way. And I do have an asterisk there because at Egalia, of course, it's a company. There's work that has to be done. But there's a culture of trying to find a solution if something's not working for you. Uh, the culture is in part that if something's not working for you, you bring it forward and try yourself to find some other way to contribute, but also that other Egalians will help you do that. Um, we recognize that people are different and bring different things to the table. And this is just uh, a baseline fact about humans, I guess, in general. But also, we uh, have many problems similar to FOSS. 
at Agalia specifically, and I think that's in part because we're fully remote. Um, but we do, and maybe because we hire from the free and open so source software community a lot, actually. Um, but we do have some trouble onboarding and training new members, specifically bringing on junior members. Um, and a, just like in free software projects, you kind of have to be pretty good at learning by yourself in order to be comfortable at Agalia. Um, we are constantly you know, problem solving and aware of this and trying to figure out ways to make that better, but it's an ongoing problem that we see. And also there are certain kinds of diversity that Agalia reflects from the broader free and open source software community. Uh, although in some ways we're very diverse <laughs> and that we have so many uh, cultures representative, re represented, it's still quite a majority, um, I don't know what to call it, but maybe the global north white men. Um, but anyway, well, they're, they're, we're working on it, though, just, just like the free software community is. So um, looking to the future of Agalia. Anyway, that was, that was Agalia as it is now. That's kind of like a snapshot. Um, again, the culture of change, I think, and accepting change and accepting experimentation and looking at what works and, and fails and how to tweak things is important to the success of a co-op. So here's a snapshot from July 26, 2024, right? Okay. Uh, anyway, but looking to the future, just for fun. Um, we don't know how much a Galia will grow every year. We actually discuss it. We, we decide how much we want to grow the various technology teams based on uh, how much business we're getting in them. But we have a strong desire to maintain the culture that we have. And we also uh, know that we have to update our processes as we grow and that um, causes strain and it's a bit of work. So in general, we grow pretty slowly. I mean, we're 140 people after 22 years. Um, but a glimpse of the future is that sometimes when we think about it, we think we might see more independent technology teams, more support roles belonging to individuals within the teams. And uh, this last point really, you know, this is outland, like really looking, no one actually thinks this is going to happen tomorrow or necessarily at all, but sometimes we do talk about, like, maybe there'll be a federated Egalia. Maybe that's the right solution for our future. So that is the whole talk that I have for you now, which leaves um, quite a bit of time for questions intentionally. And I also wanted to say that we have a full day of talks about various co-op topics in this room ahead of us. This is the first day of the tech co-op track. And we also have a panel discussion at 4.30 with all the speakers and some extra people to talk about co-ops. Um, that's, that's it. Maybe people should come up here and ask the questions in the mic if they have questions. Wow, fun question. <laughs> How does an international meeting find time for a half-day meeting? Um, it's, a, it's a bit of a bummer, I can say that, especially for us on the West Coast. I see some nods from my coworkers because our meeting starts at 4 a.m. every two months. We have two days of meetings from 4 a.m. to 8 a.m. But I don't feel so bad because personally I would prefer that to the people in Australia who have to start at 11 p.m. Um, I, I'm an early to bed, early to rise kind of gal. Uh, but also we do shift the assemblies sometimes to try to make up for that, but the majority of the Egalians are in the Central European time zone. So it just, that's how it works out for now. Yes? Uh, the question was, we talked about growth, but has Egalia ever dealt with contraction? And well, actually no. I. I was thinking of giving a slide of our growth, but um, again, because the attrition is so low, uh, we've never had one year less members than the year before. Shauna. The question is, how has Egalia handled the 2008 crisis and the recent COVID crisis? Um, well, 
Uh, I think that there, there were crises crises in a way that happened at the company around both of those times where we lost significant chunks of our business. The one more recently was much smaller because I think by now we've learned to diversify our income quite a bit. Um, so we were able to recover from the, the, the loss of income during the tech austerity period pretty quickly. Earlier on it took much longer because we had a huge customer and we lost a huge part of our salary. And we didn't fire anyone, but um, there was a short period where uh, salaries were adjusted uh, until everyone was fully booked again. Um, and that money was eventually paid back. It was so I think that in part because at Agalia, the work that we were doing was always at least somewhat diverse. We were able to explore other areas of work pretty quickly. I mean, I wasn't, from, I wasn't there during the the one that happened a half a century ago, but we never fired people, and uh, there's a resiliency in cooperatives, which I'm not the only person to talk about, um, and I think is largely unrecognized. Yeah, sure. Another aspect of, is this working? Yeah. Another aspect of the finding the time for, uh, how do you find the time for those assemblies, I thought, pointing out that cooperatives have just one of the technologies cooperatives have uh, produced is efficient communications around the policy deliberations so that you can actually save time by having these well-structured large meetings instead of wasting time on a lot of back channel yeah. things that get conflict. Yeah, that's true actually. Interesting that you point it out because I think a lot of people think of co-ops as endless meetings, where um, I think that's generally not the case, because at least in a successful co-op, like I talked about, where there's high trust, you can just let other people make decisions. Where there's high trust and you know you have shared values and you have shared goals, it's not as important to like weigh in too much or to bike shed that much. I mean, we really like trust that things will evolve in a good direction, and if they're not, we can do something about it, um, that decisions are reversible. And so I have very, very few meetings at Agalia, way less than any company I've ever been in, like significantly less. I constantly brag about that to, to my um, friends, and I see some nods from my coworkers. Any other questions? Uh, two questions. Uh, go ahead. How do you deal with people who want to work less? Yeah. Um, that is a very interesting question. Um, because at Agalia for a long time, there was a strong feeling that everyone should work the same number of hours uh, a week to increase equality. Um, but that's changed recently. And also, even during that period of time, it was always possible to have an exception where you need to go half time for some reason. These exceptions are written into the assembly. They're things like having to take care of a dependent when they're sick or stuff like that. Um, so now uh, you, there's a bit more of a flexible work schedule where you can work four days or five days or anywhere in between without this exception where you have to like request to the assembly. But anyway, so that's, I think that answers your question. Um, but I think also maybe a little bit more, again, back to the cultural values um, so that you can work less. And you can also take time off, like leaves of absences, quite easily. The, uh, there's a culture of doing that with a lot of advanced notice so that we can wrap up contracts or whatever else. Um, but you can take extended uh, leave. Um, but there is a culture of, I mean, we, we hire a lot of people in free software who really enjoy their work. Um, a lot of us at Agalia really enjoy our work. I love almost everything I do uh, during the work week. But, you know, some people want to work less, which I respect.
Yeah. 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 So the question is about the tension between um, shared values, equality, and the fact that human beings are all very, very different. And if you want to have a diverse group of people, um, how do you balance these things? Um, so I can say that, you know, Agalia is just one company. And uh, we do have some explicit shared values and shared goals. And you probably shouldn't work there if you don't agree with those uh, shared values and shared goals. And we don't hire people who don't have those shared values and goals. So the already, that part is sort of solved for the most part. I know values are is a little more complicated, but we, um, I think I, I'm not going to try to go into it too much, but I guess the scope of the co-op is small enough that there is a lot that everyone shares those values and goals. The scope of the co-op is to do for us all to have work that we find interesting in free and open source software, um, and there's some nuance and there's some disagreements about values, um, which I don't totally feel comfortable getting into right here. But um, those are sm very small parts of the majority of our work. Like every once in a while, there's a contract where we're like, mm, that's kind of like maybe we shouldn't do that. And there's a discussion about it. And some people believe we should, and some people believe we shouldn't. So that's, a, that's like a disagreement over values. But it's so rare that that happens that we just don't do those contracts. Is that enough of an answer? Yeah, right. There, yeah. To repeat that, uh, acknowledging there is a tension, but so far we've effectively navigated it. Yes. Have you been able to uh, collaborate with other cooperatives who have constraints um, in terms of providing service, such as like you know, one design is insane, or um, is that something that you all discuss or that came across for you? No, so the question is, do we support other co-ops? Um, I think that we've invested in a communication co-op once. Again, you know, I've only been at Agalia for two years, so it's just like my memory of a discussion. Um, but that that's why we're here, actually. That's why we have this one-day track at FOSSI. It's the first step towards us doing a little bit more co-op outreach and more co-op to co-op connections. Also, you know, at this point, oh, oh, well, things are almost, I guess maybe we should transition in a minute um, and give a little bit of a break before the next talks, but uh, there was another question, I think. Yeah, very, very good question. Uh, the equal equalness of pay across countries. Yeah, this is this is where I'm. I mentioned briefly that the inequality of the world really butts heads with the goal of equality in a single cooperative, um, especially as we hire internationally. And at Agalia, the way that we handle that is just the money that we spend on each Agalian is the same. The money we spend on salary, uh, so it doesn't. My healthcare is not covered by a galley, or it's covered in some complicated legal way. Um, I don't know. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, it, it's just to, to some extent we just are aware that there's some complexities we won't solve, and trying to solve them will lead us down a rabbit hole that will probably lead to more resentment than solutions. Frankly, it's just uh, anyway. So that's just something we. That's what we do. All right, cool. Well, um, we're going to have maybe a 10-minute break before the next two talks. And thank you for coming to the talk. <laughs>